Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for a Q&A session on introducing allergens to babies during COVID-19. I'm Jennifer Gertz, Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and I'm joined by uh, with uh, Dr. Alyssa Amrins and Dr. Edmund Chan. As many of you are aware with our organization, we're a national not-for-profit charity and we're the leading patient organization that's focused on food allergy. What you may not be aware of is that we are reliant on uh, the generosity of donors to fund our work. So if, uh, if you're able and can consider a donation to Food Allergy Canada, that would be greatly appreciated. Now today's session is a, is a bit different than other sessions that we've done. It's a new format in that we're going to have just a short amount of time on presentation and we're gonna leave the bulk of time uh, for questions and answers. Um, it's also different because we have both healthcare professionals and parents on this, uh, uh, on this webinar. Um, and we had asked in advance if we'd recommended that you uh, reviewed the webinars that we have on the content around early introduction and ask for your questions. And thank you because we got a tremendous number of questions. We've attempted to group those questions into themes um, so that we can answer as many of them as possible. So if it's not exactly the wording of the question you've submitted, um, please understand that we're trying to cover off a lot of uh, ver a variety of questions under those themes. So what I'd like to do is just get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way before we start. Uh, please note that this session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. We'd ask that you talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions that you have regarding your own health or the health of your child. Second, we'd ask that all participants uh, are, uh, stay muted so that we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. If you do have some specific questions throughout the session, please submit them in the chat box. And uh, although we have a, a number of different questions to get through, we'll try and get to those questions as well. And lastly, uh, this webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards in case you want to refer back to it. I'd like to introduce our speakers today and uh, the uh, two allergists that are joining us for today's Q&A session. First, we have Dr. Alyssa Abrams. Dr. Abrams is a Canadian pediatric allergist and an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics section of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at the University of Manitoba and the co-author of the Canadian Pediatric Society Practice Point on the Introduction of Allergenic Foods. She's the Vice Chair of Amphylaxis in the Food Allergy Section at the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and President of the Allergy Section of the Canadian Pediatric Society. She's also a member of the Healthcare Advisory Board for Food Allergy Canada. Dr. Edmund Chan is a Canadian Pediatric Allergist, a UBC Clinical professor, Associate Professor and Head of the Division of Allergy and Immunology in the Department of Pediatrics at BC Children's Hospital and is also a co-author of the Canadian Pediatric Society Practice Point on the Introduction of Allergenic Foods. He is also on the Board of Directors at the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and on the Executive of the Allergy Section of the Canadian Pediatric Society. He's also a member of the Healthcare Advisory Board for Food Allergy Canada and the Steering Committee for the National Food Allergy Action Plan. What we'd like to do now uh, to start off this session is uh, put a poll question out to our audience, just to get a sense of where everybody is at on the topic of early introduction. So here's the poll question we would like you to answer and recognize we've got healthcare professionals and parents. So for healthcare professionals, would you recommend allergenic foods to a four to six month old infant? And parents, if you could answer would you introduce or would you rec uh, would you introduce uh, allergenic foods to a four to six month old infant? If you could take a couple of uh, uh, seconds to uh, indicate your answer. Okay, the, the poll is just in progress. All right, excuse the, docking, the barking dog in the background. Okay, so we have a high degree of support for this and we're gonna, we're gonna revisit this poll at the end of uh, today's session as well. So I'd now like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Edmund Chan um, and he is going to uh, help uh, set the context for our discussion as it relates to food allergy. 
Dr. Chan. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer, for the uh, introduction. Thank you for everyone who's attending for your interest in this topic. It's a topic that's very near and dear to uh, our hearts, uh, Dr. Abrams and I, and uh, it's a pleasure to talk about it. So I'd like to start us off by getting us all on a level playing field and, and just by you know, the answer to this poll question that I just saw, uh, I suspect that everyone who's attending right now is uh, already quite knowledgeable about food allergy in many ways. But just so we get everyone on a level playing field, I'm going to start with some basic uh, definitions related to diagnosis. And this comes from the 2010 uh, NIH food allergy guideline. And that reference is uh, maintained on purpose just to illustrate that the way we diagnose food allergy in 2020 still is based on methods, mainly uh, taking a very detailed history that haven't changed since then. Uh, some of the cutting edge, newer diagnostic options on the horizon, hopefully, we'll get to in a future webinar. So uh, just take a few steps back from food allergy uh, the guideline describes any adverse reaction to a food as an abnormal reaction, which can be subdivided into toxic and non-toxic responses. And so toxic are your typical food poisoning situations. And within non-toxic, you have either food allergy, which is immune mediated, or food intolerance slash sensitivity, which is not immune mediated. Next slide, please. And if we delve a bit deeper into each, with the food allergy, there's different immune mechanisms uh, that uh, are used to describe it. And so it may be surprising to you to see that something like eosinophilic esophagitis or, or food protein induced enterocolitis are still uh, described as food allergy, even though those are not anaphylactic type of responses. But you know, for an immune based type of definition, it's easier to lump everything under the umbrella of food allergy that's immune mediated and then talk about different mechanisms. So the topic of today will focus entirely on the IgE mediated food allergy, which is the potentially anaphylactic one. For food intolerance, there's different specific examples is the best way to describe it because it's such a, a hodgepodge of different types of uh, uh, issues. So you may have a child with lactose intolerance, missing lactase enzyme. Uh, you may have a child who has uh, a patient who has a heightened sensitivity to pharmacologic substances, uh, for example, caffeine. And then uh, quite often we, we do see this in uh, our clinics, uh, uh, patients who have a food aversion. They've been avoiding a certain food for many years and uh, actually have a psychological aversion to it. Next slide, please. Now, um, on the next slide, we're going to talk about the typical symptoms one would expect for an IgE mediated food allergy. So really, you can sort of condense you know, a, a typical history into key criteria, which is it really needs to be an immediate reaction, typical onset of symptoms within two hours of ingestion, and the duration shouldn't drag on for days. Typically, the reaction comes and it goes, so it goes away within 24 hours. Uh, the symptoms are very typical uh, in that uh, you get hives or swelling, uh, you may have respiratory symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms such as vomiting, uh, and you know, there's various definitions of anaphylaxis. But the symptoms don't tend to venture beyond those uh, systems, typically. Uh, the type of food is, is very typical. There's a, a list that I'll go over. Uh, and then the, the reaction, of course, can be like threatening, potentially anaphylactic. Uh, another feature that uh, we really um, find quite important is the history has to be relatively recent. So if the child is now 12 and the reaction the last time it occurred was 10 years ago, that child may have outgrown the food allergy. And one you know, uh, uh, aspect that parents ask us about frequently is uh, how about a, ch a food that my child eats every day, uh, like, like milk or wheat, for example, could my child be allergic to that? And that uh, to us is actually 
a good scientifically that the child is not uh, uh, allergic in this sense of IgE mediated food allergy uh, because the suspected food uh, typically is not eaten regularly. So, so for example, like a nut, it's like when they're accidentally exposed, the reaction occurs. The non-IgE mediated food allergy involves severe delayed gastrointestinal symptoms, which uh, again are not the topic of today. So next slide. Uh, the majority of IgE mediated food allergy is due to this relatively short list of foods. And so there's an asterisk beside milk, egg, and peanut. Those three allergens are by far and away the most common in countries like Canada. Uh, tree nut and sesame seed allergy appears to be increasing uh, in uh, prevalence. And um, for fish and shellfish allergy, at least in children, it's relatively rare. It's more of an issue in adults. Soy and wheat allergy are relatively rare uh, triggers of IgE mediated food allergy. So wheat, the typical context is, is more of a discussion of whether a child might have celiac disease, for example. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Jennifer. Thank you, Dr. Chan. So now we're going to um, uh, turn it over to Dr. Abrams to just remind us of the guidance uh, that exists on early introduction with the CPS. Dr. Abrams? Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you everyone who is taking the time to listen and participate today. As Dr. Chan said, this is a topic that's indeed very near and dear to our hearts. So myself and Dr. Chan put out a practice point in 2019, looking at when to introduce allergic solids in infants at high risk. And this guide was applicable in 2019, and it's the same guidance now, even during COVID-19. So we defined an infant at high risk if the infant themselves have an allergy, for example, if the infant has eczema or already has a food allergy, in addition, an infant is at high risk if someone in their immediate family has an allergic condition, such as eczema, food allergy, asthma, or hay fever. And the recommendation would be if an infant fits that risk criteria, so they have allergies or they have an immediate family history of allergies, introduce allergic solids at around six months of age, but not before four months of age. And those allergenic solids were on the previous slide by Dr. Chen. Next slide, please. The allergenic solid should be introduced one at a time, which will help a family figure out what a child is reacting to, if anything. But you don't have to have an unnecessary delay of days to weeks between each food. And a really, really important point, if the food is tolerated, keep it in the diet, ideally a few times a week. You almost have to remind the baby's body not to start reacting. So once it's fed, make sure it remains in the diet if it's well tolerated. And finally, as with all solid introduction, it should be based on the developmental readiness of the baby. So babies should be ready for solids in general, such as they can hold their head up, they have good neck control, and they can sit with support. Next slide, please. If the baby is lower risk, meaning they don't have allergies, no one in their immediate family has allergies, the recommendation would be when baby starts to have solids in general at around six months of age, you can also introduce the allergenic solids. And a final point, introducing allergic solids is not meant to replace breastfeeding. The current Canadian recommendations for breastfeeding are unchanged, which is if mom, mothers are willing and able, they should continue to breastfeed for up to two years and beyond. And with that, I'll hand it back to Jennifer. So I want to start with the first uh, theme of questions. And it was really around, there's a lot of questions that came up around how to understand what actually constitutes high risk. So there were some questions around, can you help us understand what um, the definition of high risk, maybe help us explain why is there a difference between what the CPS guidance is and the NIAID guidance uh, that's been provided back in 2019? And if you can also speak to just the role of eczema overall. Dr. Chan, could you uh, uh, tackle these uh, suite of questions for us? Sure. So there is a discrepancy currently between what's in our Canadian CPS practice point that Dr. Abrams just uh, quickly reviewed and what's in the latest American Prevention Guideline, which is the 2017 uh, National Institutes of Health NIAID Guideline for Peanut Allergy Prevention. 
So uh, there's, you know, one way to think about it is, is there's been an evolution of uh, definition of high risk over the years. And so for the 2017 one, the NIAID one, they chose to just describe the infant's medical history. So an infant who has severe eczema and or egg allergy is in that highest risk category. An infant with moderate eczema is in an intermediate category. An infant with uh, very little eczema or no eczema is in the lowest risk category. It didn't talk about family history at all. For our 2019 CPS practice point, we took elements of our 2013 uh, practice point uh, position statement, which was based on family history. So a first degree relative, meaning mother, father, brother, or sister with an allergic condition such as eczema, uh, asthma, food allergy, or allergic rhinitis, uh, and combine that with what was in the uh, uh, NIAID uh, guideline, which is a, a personal history of ATP in the infant, which at that very young age of infancy is typically eczema. And so we feel that the CPS practice point is uh, a bit more expansive and uh, captures uh, clinical scenarios that uh, may not be captured uh, within the uh, NIA definition of high risk. Okay. So, yeah. Great. Okay, now uh, specific to the seriousness of, or sever severity of eczema, like that's a tough one for people to understand. What do we mean by the severity of eczema? So can you speak a little bit more to, you know, some guidance that might help people understand that assessment of what's considered severe? Yeah, I, I really empathize with both practitioners and parents when it comes to this thorny topic of, of how do we define eczema and then severe eczema. Because if you look at the NIA definition of severe eczema, to uh, a parent or practitioner, it's not necessarily that informative. So some of the key elements of that NIA definition are that it has to be persistent, it has to have a typical appearance, and it has to be assessed to be severe by a healthcare provider, and it has to require prescription strength medications. So those are quite broad descriptions. And I don't know if any of you listening, just based on those four things I said, have a very good mental picture of what an infant with severe eczema has based on that. But, but I don't actually, just listing off those four things. And so uh, what, you know, the specialty as a whole and, and in collaboration with dermatologists and, and other, other uh, healthcare providers need to try to come up with is something that's a bit more illustrative and concrete and, and detail oriented, maybe a photo. Uh, I know that uh, when we're having discussions with Food Allergy Canada, we're trying to aim for something a bit more pictorial that's helpful for, for parents. But um, you know, in, when, when I uh, see an infant with severe eczema, to me, having uh, quite a widespread, like a, a large body surface area involved is helpful to me. But you know, I was a part of the NIAID guideline uh, panel, and when we, I remember when we had our discussions with the dermatologists, they didn't want to peg a specific percent body surface area. They felt that would be too restrictive, and so they didn't want to say, "Oh, a severe eczema is an infant who has more than 10% or 20% of their skin uh, covered with severe eczema." Um, so if we could somehow arrive at, at how extensive the rash has to be, and some type of some type of picture that we can all agree on, even in a cartoon format, to illustrate how how severe that rash looks. I really feel that uh, that would help uh, immensely. Uh, but okay. short of that, um, yeah, you know, it, maybe if practitioners could think of, um, you know, if they've seen a lot of children with eczema, uh, think of like the past 100 infants or children they've seen with eczema, and you know, have in mind. The, the most severe sort of like five or 10 percent and, and you know that would be maybe more in the severe category uh, or you know even look up uh, uh, various references to look at photos uh, pictures worth a thousand words photos of infants who have eczema and typically in, in various references where there's photos you'll see mild moderate and severe and and that uh, could be helpful okay terrific 
Well, listen, I want to move on because we've got lots of questions here, and I'm sure there's more questions about uh, eczema that we could spend an entire webinar on that topic in itself. Um, but I'd like to, to uh, move to a question for Dr. Abrams related to uh, breastfeeding. So the, the questions, we've received a few questions on breastfeeding, but I'm going to read this one because I think it's a good example of uh, the types of questions that have been asked. Do breastfed babies receive peanut protein or proteins from other priority allergens via breast milk, therefore building immunity to the allergen before introducing them? Dr. Abrams? So that's a really great question. Yeah, that's, it's a great question and it speaks to the broader role of, you know, a question we get asked all the time, should moms be eating these foods when they're pregnant or when they're breastfeeding and would doing that help prevent allergy? The short, simple answer is we're not sure. A longer answer is, you know, older studies said maybe no. There are some newer studies in particular for peanut that suggest maybe. You know, there was a recent Canadian study that showed that kids who were at lower, lowest risk of peanut allergy, not just ate peanut early, but also had moms who were eating peanut when they were breastfeeding. In general, we don't recommend that moms remove any foods from their diet when they're pregnant or breastfeeding for nutrition issues, but whether actively eating these foods will help prevent allergies, we don't know for sure yet. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abrams. Okay, I want to move on to a topic area around um, testing and, and screening. Um, and this one uh, is directed to you, Dr. Chan. Do parents need to get testing done like a skin prick test before doing early introduction if an infant's high risk? I mean, we're going back to a little bit of the NIAID guidelines there, but uh, speak to us about your perspective on that and, and really get to the point of when would you recommend getting tested? In what situation do you think testing is merited? Yeah. Um... Short answer is my personal recommendation is no, to not get tested before introduction. But it's, uh, I really have to describe that that's a very, very controversial topic. And so since the LEAP study in 2015, learning early about peanut allergy study, uh, the clinical trial was published, there's been so much debate about this topic. It's actually quite exhausting the debate amongst uh, allergists. Uh, um, Part of the reason for it was because the LEAP study uh, actually did uh, screening testing um, for the purposes of research in order to recruit infants into the study. And then some allergists were curious and wondering if that same approach used in research could be used in the real world. But of course, the real world is a whole different kettle of fish when you have to consider uh, scarcity of resources. And so you can imagine what a logistical nightmare it would be uh, to skin test, um, you know, any infant deemed to be at higher risk. You know, we just described uh, infants at high risk because, um, you know, a lot of the concern for, for many of us, including myself, is that it could be a slippery slope. So I just described how severe edema has a, a sort of vague definition. Even if you look at the NIAID guideline, it's unclear what severe eczema looks like. So many parents who have infants with even mild or moderate eczema might think that their child fits in that category. And NIA actually says that that severe eczema category, you need to get a screening. You need to get a skin test or a specific IgE blood test before you start peanuts in that infant. So I was part of that uh, expert panel and there was a lot of debate even during all those meetings for that guideline. And this was the final product, which uh, I personally uh, was not a fan of for the Canadian context. Um, so what Dr. Abrams and I are working on is an update to the 2013 CPS position statement. Uh, in the 2013 position statement, it said that uh, screening is not recommended uh, because of issues like uh, difficulty with access uh, with uh, allergists who could interpret a, a uh, positive uh, skin test result in an infant. Also difficulties with access uh, with allergists who can offer infant oral food challenges. Uh, there's not a ton of uh, collective experience uh, doing those amongst the uh, allergist community. Uh, there's increasing experience, but still not a ton. And so uh, for uh, the update, which we're working on, we want to maintain that message, but also uh, describe what the NIA guideline recommended and try to just reconcile it with uh, our Canadian context. The 2019 
practice point that Dr. Abrams just uh, presented, uh, it didn't have the bandwidth to describe uh, what to do about screening. Now, the second part of your question was, when would I recommend an infant getting tested? So it's really an infant where the parent has tried to introduce at home and the child has had a convincing reaction, then uh, I would recommend that they get uh, tested. Uh, typically, um, you know, they start with a primary care physician and then get a referral where uh, warranted to uh, a specialist. Um, there could also be a scenario which uh, we, we, you know, have difficulty with quite often uh, this, uh, 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 coming up with the best approach, but it's with the family who's hesitant. So there's no like bad reaction that's occurred to the infant, but because of a, an older sibling who has a food allergy or because of other reasons, there's just hesitancy. And uh, that could be a, a good reason to at least get referred. And then at the consultation, a discussion as to whether testing should be done or an observed ingestion or other approaches. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, let's move on. We're, we will get to, by the way, some uh, questions related to reactions and understanding reactions. But first, we'd like to cover off some of the questions around, you know, actually the practical application of doing this, what and how to feed. So uh, back to you, Dr. Abrams, for some of the questions that came under this uh, area. What's the best way to prepare the allergen to give to a four to six month old uh, baby? And what kind of quantity should we be thinking about you know, and, and which foods should be given first? Okay, so that's a great question, a very practical question. And there is no one right answer here. In general, baby needs to be ready developmentally to eat solids and the allergic solids have to be given in an age appropriate way. So for example, you'd never give a whole peanut to a baby because it's a choking risk. There are some practical things you could try. So for peanut, for example, you could take some smooth peanut butter and mix it with boiling water so it's really, really liquidy. Wait for it to cool down and then add it to a pureed fruit or an already tolerated grain cereal, something baby's already eating. A really important point is you want the baby to eat the food. So never first introduce, for example, by rubbing food on the surface of the skin. The first time baby sees the food, it should be going into the mouth and not on the surface of the skin. And then the other really important point is once it's fed, keep it in the diet. So if baby eats peanut and does well with peanut, make sure that there's ongoing exposure to peanut, which sort of reminds the baby's body not to start reacting to it. There are specific quantities that have been recommended, but these are really mostly based on research studies. The goal is get some into baby and keep it up regularly. Okay, and when you say regularly, and I know even in the CPS guidance, guidance, it's kind of reducing allergens without unnecessary delay. What what do we mean by regular, and what do we mean about you know the the parameters around unnecessary delay with no unnecessary delay? Sure. So in the CPS practice point, we recommend it a few times a week. So basically, the baby should be seeing this food on a very regular basis. I tend to focus on. Um, the most common allergens, and that goes back to Dr. Chan's slide, so nuts, milk, and egg. And then in terms of delay, you know, this was actually something we talked a lot about when we were doing the CPS practice point, because it's largely expert opinion, how long you wait between each solid food. Usually reactions happen pretty quickly, especially with the allergic foods. So practically one or two days between each solid food, you don't have to wait weeks. Okay, terrific. And this whole idea of if you're concerned that the baby is not eating enough, you know, what's your what's your view on that? Well, that's so tricky with babies. You know, even within the same family, kids can eat differently when they're babies. Some babies are voracious eaters and everything you feed them, they do wonderfully with. Other babies are picky eaters. The, the most important thing from my perspective is to keep it in the diet on a regular basis. Keep feeding it regularly, try different ways. So spread some thin peanut butter on toast, mix it into a baby cereal, mix it into a pureed fruit, and just try to make sure that there's this ongoing regular exposure. Okay, and on the ongoing regular exposure, so um, it's been introduced, it's been kept in the diet two to three times a week. Uh, what, how long do you have to keep that going, right? right. Like, is that... 
So that's another good question where there's no easy answer for. So they're learning early about peanut study that Dr. Chen referenced, which was the sort of big monumental study that showed that eating peanut early prevents peanut allergy, looked at eating peanut in infancy and eating it on an ongoing basis until the age of five or avoiding peanut until the age of five. Practically, do we know that you have to eat peanut a few times a week until you're five? We don't. There isn't really an easy answer there. So my practical recommendation in particular for things like nuts is put it into the diet and then make it part of the family routine that it's eaten. So if it's already part of your family's diet, wonderful, keep it there. If it isn't, make some concerted effort to introduce it into foods that are eaten on an ongoing basis in early childhood. Okay. Now, um, the other thing around uh, tree nuts, because you brought up the, the topic of, of, of nuts and tree nuts, do all tree nuts need to be introduced to an infant? Okay, so that's another great question where once again, there is no short answer. So there has never been a study showing that eating tree nuts early prevents tree nut allergy, but there probably won't be. You know, we have so much evidence now that eating early is helpful that it's unlikely that there's gonna be a lot of other huge studies looking at other allergens. And I know practically myself and Dr. Chen are seeing a lot of tree nut allergy. So I include tree nuts in the list of, or the short list of foods that I really try to recommend feeding early. There are different ways to do it. And so, for example, while the CPS practice point says, do one food at a time, a practical way to do tree nuts is a smooth mixed tree nut butter. There are some available, and that would be one potential discrepancy with what we usually recommend, just because there are several common tree nuts and introducing each in an age appropriate way sequentially, and then keeping them all in the diet on an ongoing basis is very challenging. All right, and in that case, then how do you decide if someone, if you're you're using the mixed tree nuts and there there's reacting, what do you do next? Like, given that it's a mixture. Yeah, and that's a great question. In general, if there's a reaction to tree nuts, unless there's been a lot of tolerance to other tree nuts, often babies are avoiding tree nuts pending allergy testing. So it would be the exact same. You would take the tree nuts out of the diet. Okay, another question came in about um, licking peanut butter. Okay, if a child is at high risk and they're not really developmentally ready for solids, could you offer them a, a lick of peanut butter to allow for earlier introduction? Sure. Okay, great. Um, now, this other topic that comes up with, around the complexity of introducing these allergenic foods. When you have family members where there is, for example, a fish allergy, um, how do you go about introducing that? And I know we've talked about that in previous webinars, but I think it would be really helpful for you, Dr. Abrams, to, to, to give the parents listening um, some additional perspectives on this. Sure, and that is very much a conversation with the family. For some families, they're very motivated to do it in the home, and they're comfortable feeding in the home. For other families, they are just, there's a, a strong, understandable hesitancy against feeding these foods in the home. So if it's circumstance A where the family's comfortable, there's a few safety measures that you can put into place that basically keeps the allergic child safe, which is making sure the allergic child doesn't eat the food themselves and washing surfaces with soap and water. Good old soap and water clears allergens off of surfaces. You can have the food in the home, the vapors of the food for things like nuts, the smell of peanut butter will not cause a systemic reaction. So you just wanna make sure that the allergic child doesn't actively eat it. Now, if the family says, you know, we understand, but we're just not comfortable, that's completely understandable. A practical thing I'll recommend is that if there are other extended family members that are nearby, or if there's a parent that can, once or twice a week have a, for example, a peanut date, where the child is out of the home and you feed age appropriate forms of that food outside of the home. Terrific. Okay, so one more question, then I'm going to go back to Dr. Chan on, a, on, on the next topic. This one came in uh, uh, over the chat. Um, mm -hmm. why, why do you have to have the ingestion be orally and not on the skin? Okay, so uh, that's a really, really important point. We think that you become allergic through the surface of the skin, and this has been an evolution and sort of ties back to feeding early. You know, kids, especially kids who have eczema, who have inflamed skin, they have allergy cells that sit right under the surface of the skin, and they often have less of a skin barrier 
than kids who don't have eczema. And effectively, the allergens can be seen by the allergy cells that sit under the surface of the skin and teach the body to start reacting to it. So in fact, we would recommend never rubbing these foods on the surface of the skin. It is potentially a way that a child could become allergic. If you're going to try to introduce a food to a child, it should always be orally through the mouth. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chen, we've got a series of questions that relates to age because of this guidance, of course, being four to six months. We've got situations where, you know what, that didn't happen. So uh, in the case of this question, they have a 10 month old and they haven't introduced any of these allergens. Is it until 12 months that's still considered early introduction? What's your perspective on, hey, we missed the window. What should we do now? Yeah, so Dr. Abrams, I keep referring back to the LEAP study because it's really truly such a landmark clinical trial. And in that study, they recruited high-risk infants between four to 11 months of age. So uh, according to that, a 10-month-old is still within that window and it's uh, you know, very reasonable to introduce and, and not be worried that they've missed the window. Uh, a 12-month-old is where we start getting a little bit uncomfortable. So not that you know there's a dramatically higher risk for that 12-month-old, but there's uh, you know, data that once you wait beyond one year of age, uh, then the risk you know, increases of developing a food allergy. And certainly even within the LEAP study, uh, you had the group that wasn't introduced early. Um, they had a much higher risk of developing food allergy down the line. Uh, and so, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what that 12-month-old infant should do, it's really, a lot of this is individualizing and having a discussion with those parents uh, that, um, you know, what's that individual infant's uh, risk factors? Like within this definition of high risk that we talked about earlier, there are still, you know, various permutations within that. So you could have uh, an infant who has a, a mother who has allergic rhinitis, according to the CPS practice point definition, or you could have a, an infant with severe eczema, widespread, uh, uh, you know, unrelenting despite use of prescription strength topical medications, uh, together with uh, an older sibling with a food allergy and asthma, uh, and, and, you know, maybe that 12-month-old has already developed asthma at that age. And so that would be a whole different kettle of fish from uh, the infant who just has a, a one family member with uh, an allergic condition. And, um, you know, if uh, upon discussion and individualizing that parent feels quite hesitant to introduce at home, and I would totally empathize if they did, then they would, you know, require some sort of assessment uh, and, uh, uh, you know, maybe even a discussion of testing. All right. Now, and would it would your perspectives be different for um, uh, people that are immigrating to, like if they've, if you're, you know, as a, a toddler from uh, another country who hasn't even been exposed to those types of allergens in their, their, uh, the country that they immigrated from, would you use the same strategies that you just talked about now, or, or how would you approach that? Is the, the question a, a little bit different? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's not a ton of uh, studies on this, but uh, there are some about the immigrant situation, the recent immigrant. And uh, there's one study from Australia, uh, especially, where they looked at uh, Asians, uh, immigrants who immigrated to Australia and compared, uh, when they had infants in Australia, the risk compared to um, uh, non-Asian families that uh, had been in Australia for quite some time. And they, uh, they found that the Asian immigrants who were having uh, infants uh, in Australia were at the highest risk. Um, and, and, you know, if you look then at uh, immigrants who have the babies in another country and then move to uh, a Western country like, uh, like Canada, you would assume that based on all, all of those studies that uh, they're at lower risk. So to me, uh, a toddler immigrating from another country, uh, if it's a, a less well-developed country, uh, probably is at lower risk. If it's uh, just an equally developed country like Canada, they're at the, the same uh, risk. And uh, it's really that same type of discussion that I just had about the 12-month-old. If that two-year-old uh, has severe asthma, uh, severe eczema, uh, already has uh, some food allergy, 
and it just hasn't introduced uh, another food, allergenic food, uh, then I would be quite uh, worried about them just going all out uh, at home and at least you know having a discussion with the family whether they're comfortable uh, uh, with that scenario and if a reaction were to occur, what would they do uh, with it? Uh, very different from a two-year-old who moves from another country and has a, has no eczema, has no family history of anything. So again, it comes down to a lot of history taking and uh, individual individualized discussion. Terrific. Okay. Thank you. So let's move on to reactions and the treatment of reactions. And I'm going to ask Dr. Abrams to tell us, kind of describe for us, what does an allergic reaction look like in an infant? And how do you know if that reaction is a mild one or a severe one? Okay. So there are a few key points that really help in terms of figuring out, is this an allergic reaction? And one of the big ones is timing. So an allergic reaction is fast. They say it should happen within two hours, but practically it's usually within 10 or 15 minutes. The child eats the food and there's a reaction. So if the child eats peanut on Monday and hives on Wednesday, it's not the peanut. It happens quickly and it goes away quickly. So almost always it's gone within a day. So this is a rapid onset reaction, comes on quickly and goes away relatively quickly as well. There are a bunch of signs and symptoms you can have with an allergic reaction. By far the most common is skin. And in general, it's things like hives. And hives look like mosquito bites or welts. And they tend to be uncomfortable and itchy. And they can spread around and they don't last on the surface of the skin, once again, more than a day. There can also be breathing signs, like coughing or wheezing. And there can be tummy signs, like vomiting and diarrhea. In general, the more severe reactions have two or more parts of the body that are affected. Now, this also leads to sort of an interesting question that we often get asked, which is, and we hear this all the time in kids with eczema who eat citrusy acidic foods. You know, my child ate tomato and they got some redness around the mouth and it's flat and it's red and it lasted three or four days. That's not an acute allergic reaction. Okay, now what about um, blood in the stool? Is that a, a sign of an allergic reaction or how should, if, if uh, parents or healthcare uh, providers are hearing about that, what, what uh, indication should they be taking away from that? So there is a non-IgE mediated or non-anaphylactic form of allergy that involves blood in the stools. These children don't tend to have allergies throughout life. It's often a condition of infancy and usually goes away between 9 to 12 months of age. The most common culprit is cow's milk. And that would necessitate, in my opinion, a discussion with a healthcare provider if that was happening. All right. And is the and for someone who is breastfeeding and they feel that their infant is having a reaction, it, 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 what would it, would a reaction look like for someone who is getting that protein through breastfeeding? Is that a question that it can be addressed with with that amount of information that I've given you? So it's it's a good question. I rarely practically see it. You know, we we often will say in general, if baby, for example, is peanut allergic, mom should. If breastfeeding, remove peanut from the diet. But I practically, I would say most of the time, find that the mothers can continue to actually eat the allergen without impacting the baby. So yes, there's a theoretical risk. There is a small amount of protein transferred to baby, but it's not something we very commonly see. Okay. Now, one more other sign that people were asking for clarification on, a post-nasal drip. Yeah. No. In isolation, no. Okay. All right. I'd like to ask a specific question related to um, cashews, and maybe I'll address this one to you, Dr. Chan. In this situation, um, this person had fed uh, their six-month-old who has mild uh, eczema um, cashew, and in, in this, the information that we've got is that she, this infant got a rash, then it went away, the same thing happened after a second feeding of cashew. You know, like when you see that, when you're seeing these rashes, should these parents continue to feed it? And, um, you know, and what about if the rash appears uh, with feeding some of the other allergenic foods, but not all? Yeah, so um, that's a difficult question to answer without knowing more details about the rash itself. And, and the thing about rash in this setting is that there can be so many different presentations of rashes. Um, you know, even two big categories. Uh, there can be an eczematous rash, which lasts for days. These are these fine little bumps and, and just rough like sandpaper. Uh, or there can be the hives, urticaria, that Dr. Abrams just described, which are the mosquito bumps, uh, the, the welts that come and go quickly. 
And so, you know, when, when it's just a word rash, then it's difficult to even conceptualize which of those two it is. And within each, there's so many different permutations and presentations with respect to timing uh, and duration and uh, other uh, aspects of it. So I'd really like to, to explore more with this uh, family, if I was seeing them, uh, the nature of the rash, asking lots of detailed questions. And, and even you know, if they have it, quite often families have it these days. They have their smartphone with them and then they take a photo of the rash. Seeing that actual photo is very, very helpful in the uh, clinical context. If it's something as mild um, as uh, some redness in the mouth, around the mouth, uh, so because the scenario was that this infant has mild eczema, and quite often that's a just sensitive skin. And so if uh, that food substance has irritated the skin, for example, redness around the mouth, then uh, quite often I counsel to just retry it and do strategies like put a layer of uh, barrier, like a Vaseline jelly, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, around the mouth before they try it again. Uh, and then uh, make sure the food isn't stuck on there for prolonged duration after the feeding, wipe it away, put on more Vaseline jelly, uh, and then take it from there. And often that solves it and it doesn't happen the next time. But if it's a, a more severe rash, like there's actual hives, welts, and it's uh, especially starting to extend beyond the area around the mouth, then, then of course I would be more concerned and they'd have to stop feeding and get that assessed. So, okay, great. Um, yeah. Okay. Now we have one more question before we go on to actually treating reactions. I, uh, this came in um, uh, and was a question that was asked previous. What about the cross reactivity um, within certain food families? Like, how do you how do you think about the introduction of um, food families that have some level of cross uh, reactivity, like legumes and and lupin? Uh, Dr. Abrams, can you address that? Sure. So in general, I recommend starting with one food from the family. So for legumes, you could do with beans or peas, whatever the case may be. There is some cross reactivity among some of these families, but it really varies. And even within studies, the amount of cross reactivity varies. So grains is a great example, where we used to think there was quite a bit of cross reactivity among the grains. And we're now finding out that there's actually less so than we had previously thought. In terms of um, trying to prioritize these foods, I tend to focus with the family on milk, egg, and nuts. And then certainly if they're interested in trying things like legumes or seeds when the baby is young and the baby is developmentally ready, you could in an age appropriate way. The big take home point though is to keep them in the diet. So whatever category of food that you try, make sure that it's a food that you can continue to expose the baby to on an ongoing basis. All right, perfect. Okay, uh, Dr. Chan, I wanna to turn to you on the question of how to treat a reaction. So we've talked about what a reaction looks like that it, uh, that it, it is uh, in terms of its onset. Someone recognizes that their infant's having a reaction, what should they do? Yeah, so, Really, it'd be helpful if uh, they were able to recognize whether the reaction is mild or severe. And so if it's a severe anaphylactic reaction, um, if there's an epi epinephrine auto-injector at home, you know, some of these families, like we said earlier, they have an older sibling or another member of the family uh, who uh, has uh, a risk for anaphylaxis, then uh, if it's the junior dose, they could administer that dose to uh, the infant if there's uh, a, a severe life for any reaction occurring. And then right after that, uh, go to the nearest emergency. Uh, if it's a mild reaction, uh, typically I, I um, you know, counsel families to just uh, watch the infant very, very carefully to see if the symptoms uh, are going to become more severe. Uh, often families really get quite worried about whether or not they need to give an antihistamine for mild symptoms. But um, you know, from my perspective, it's totally optional. It's a comfort measure. Uh, it uh, reduces you know, the amount of itch, for example, but it really doesn't touch any severe symptoms. And when you talk about antihistamines, it gets to the complexity of which choice of antihistamine, which is like a whole different topic in itself. Uh, many families actually still to this day have uh, Benadryl at home which is um, not as, you know, those of you who follow, you know, how that has developed that discussion, it's not a recommended choice. We discourage use of Benadryl 
first generation antihistamines because they're sedating. And, and so, you know, I, I, I often, uh, I'm, I'm not that keen to recommend antihistamines, recognizing that uh, parents don't have non-sedating liquid antihistamines for infants at home. Um, so it really depends on the severity of the reaction, uh, what to do. Okay, great. Now, now, uh, but using an EpiPen Junior, if they had one on an infant, um, is that is that fine? Yeah, that's been discussed in many um, you know, publications over the years. Uh, that uh, is uh, where the benefit outweighs the risk. Of course, you know, if you have a, a young infant, uh, then the EpiPen Junior is ideally designed for a child weighing 15 kilograms, and you'd be overdosing. But an overdose for a child who is having severe anaphylaxis and difficulty breathing and, and, and maybe loss of consciousness, uh, of course, would be more beneficial than not giving it. Interestingly, in the United States, the uh, OVQ device, uh, and, and that's going to be reintroduced as the Allergec to, to Canada soon. Um, in the US, there's a 0.1 milligram dosage for the OVQ. So uh, if that product ever becomes available in Canada in the 0.1 milligram format, then uh, that potentially could, could help alleviate some of those concerns about overdose. Okay, and if you don't have a, an EpiPen at home, what's your, what's your recommendation? Then go to the emergency, emergency uh, i.e. call 911, um, and if it makes more sense, if you live next door to the emergency, like just, just go there. Uh, okay. then uh, just go to the nearest emergency immediately. Okay, we've got one category of questions that we still want to get to before we're finished up here. And it really is about kind of the fear of introducing allergens, particularly during COVID. Um, so I'd like to hear from uh, both of you on, you know, what are some of your uh, suggestions and strategies for reassuring parents and for healthcare uh, providers on who are scared to introduce allergens at home, especially during this time. So, uh, Dr. Chan, can we start with you? Sure. Um, so, I mean, Dr. Abrams can elaborate on this as well, but we both uh, uh, just posted on the uh, CPS uh, blog, uh, Canadian Pediatric Society blog, uh, uh, recommendations for this scenario. That was posted on April the 15th. And what it uh, described mainly was that the risk of introducing uh, one of the allergens to an infant who's never ingested it before, the risk of a severe anaphylactic reaction occurring is exceedingly low. So we looked at the LEAP study. Again, we come, keep going back to the LEAP study, but the LEAP study in the uh, early introduction arm of that study, uh, which uh, was half of those uh, infants, so you know, over 300 infants, um, none of them had a severe anaphylactic reaction. Seven of those infants had a skin reaction, which uh, you know some of them involved you know widespread areas of the skin, but none of them needed uh, uh, epinephrine for a severe anaphylactic reaction. Uh, together with that, there's emerging evidence that if you take a large group of children who have experienced anaphylaxis and gone to the emergency, and you look at the subset of infants who have arrived in the emergency. Only a very tiny percentage of those infants have truly severe anaphylaxis involving things like hypotension or severe difficulty breathing. There was this one Chicago study which described less than 5% of infants presenting emergency with anaphylaxis having truly severe anaphylaxis, very different from older children. And then there's a study just published in the past few weeks, uh, a study out of California with very, very similar results. So I really like to use that type of data to reassure parents that even if they were to show up in the emergency uh, uh, with their infant in, with anaphylaxis, chances are it's, it's, it's not going to be severe anaphylaxis. So, so Dr. Abrams, okay. uh, do you have any, maybe you can add to what I just said. No, I, I think that's a great answer. It's almost exactly what I would have said, which is basically it's a pro-con. Right, and yes, there's a chance, but it's exceptionally low. The other side is you can reduce peanut allergy up to 80% by feeding. Okay. So it's a numbers game a bit, right? Yes, there's a very small chance and we all empathize and understand the heightened anxiety during these times. We all feel it ourselves, but you're comparing 
uh, less than 2% chance with an 80% chance, especially in a higher risk kid, that you can prevent a lifelong allergy. And it's a bit of a discussion with the family of the pros and cons of that in our current context. Great. Well, I wish we had another hour worth of time, um, but I think that that's a, a great way to end off this webinar. We really appreciate that uh, that um, everyone has has uh, participated in this webinar. We're going to ask the poll question one more time, even though it was a very high result in terms of the willingness to introduce or recommend allergenic foods. So if you could just take a few minutes, everyone that's uh, signed in to just indicate your choice. Are you uh, willing to introduce or recommend allergenic foods to four to six month old infants. We'll just wait a couple of minutes for the responses on that. Not a couple of minutes, just a few seconds actually. All right, so 94% uh, said yes, and we still have a few in the no and, uh, and uh, someone in the unsure area. So Thank you very much for um, your participation in the webinar today. I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, we have many more webinars that are coming up as part of our Creating a Better Future webinar series. Um, that is, uh, we've got both Dr. Abrams actually and Dr. Chan in this webinar series. Dr. Abrams' uh, session next week is on the science behind food allergy and uh, Dr. Chan's webinar in the next two weeks um, is on diagnosis and really understanding what those numbers mean. I mean, it's a, it, it, the diagnostic picture it was touched on a bit today, um, but I think we'll learn a lot more in Dr. Chen's webinar on that as well. So you can sign up for those at uh, foodallergycanada.ca uh, backslash events. Um, you're also going to get a survey from us uh, this afternoon uh, via email. We really would like your uh, um, help in completing this survey because it's important for us to understand um, where the questions still exist uh, on this topic. So, uh, and it also helps us inform where we need to go next. The other thing that I would make you aware of is we do have a patient resource uh, material that's going to be posted on our website shortly around this whole topic, and we will endeavor to make you aware of that. Um, and lastly, we would like to thank our sponsors for their support. We'd like to thank uh, Pfizer Canada, Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation and the Peanut Bureau of Canada uh, for being able to support uh, this uh, webinar today. So in the next few days, um, what you're going to see is that this will be, there will be a recording of this webinar that appears on our website um, and, uh, and you can share that with others uh, who you think may benefit. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. This now concludes our webinar.